Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the East Asia Center Lecture Series, uh, Assessing Prospects for War and Peace in the Taiwan Straits with Professor Scott Kasser from the University of Maryland, who we're very excited to, to welcome here to our East Asia Center Speaker Series. Uh, so the East Asia Center was founded in 1975, uh, almost 50 years ago, to provide a forum for faculty and students interested in East Asia. And we sponsor speaker series, grant programs, and promote academic activities and cultural events for the college and the university. So if any of these things sound interesting to you, speaker series, grants to travel to East Asia, or cultural events, please be sure to sign up on our listserv, and we will be sure to share that information with you. Um, I'm Ann Kokus, Professor of Media Studies at the University of Virginia, Director of the UVA East Asia Center, and the CKN Professor at the Miller Center. Uh, and we're excited to have this opportunity to bring together faculty, students, and staff to talk about this important issue. I'm grateful to co-sponsors, the East Asia Center, the Coughlin Fund for East Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, the Whedon Fund, the Miller Center, and to Brian Murphy, Ariel Bernal, and Alexis Stengel for their hard work in, ex in, ex um, in executing this event. And I think we may have... Uh, and we now have Julia De Silva also to, to thank for her assistance. So today our guest, Scott Kastner, will, will share from his book, War and Peace in the Taiwan Straits. We will then open the floor for Q&A, and the East Asia Center always has a lively and fun Q&A session. So we welcome all of you to, to share your questions. Um, we especially welcome students to ask their questions because we're eager for you to have this chance to engage with our esteemed speaker. So I'm excited to introduce Scott. Uh, Scott Kastner is a professor of the Department of Government and Politics at the University of Maryland College Park. He graduated from Cornell University and the University of California, San Diego for his PhD. Much of Kastner's research focuses on international politics of East Asia, and he teaches classes on international relations, US-China relations, international political economy, and East Asia. He is the author most recently of War and Peace in the Taiwan Strait from Columbia University Press. And I'd like to point out to everyone that the book is for sale at a UVA discount price uh, and available for signing by our author uh, after today's talk. He is also the author of China's Strategic Multilateralism, um, Investing in Global Governance with Margaret Pearson and Chad Rector uh, from Cambridge University Press and Political Economy and, and Economic inter Interdependence Across the Taiwan Strait and Beyond um, from Stanford University Press. I'm also personally very grateful to Scott because uh, most recently, because he uh, very kindly invited me to join a delegation with him and Brian and a wide range of other scholars to travel to Taiwan where we got to meet the Minister of Foreign Affairs foreign affairs there. Um, and we also got the chance to talk with a variety of different scholars and politicians in Taiwan um, in 2018. So um, I've learned a lot from him in Taiwan. We also had the chance to travel to China together um, and uh, both mainland China and Hong Kong as part of the public intellectuals program for the National Committee on US-China Relations um, in 2017. And so uh, Scott is both a scholar that I really admire, and also someone who is able to engage with the public on these important issues um, in ways that are really, really important. So I'm so grateful that all of you are here today, um, that you're here to, to hear and learn from our speakers. This is a really important issue, and um, I'm very grateful to Scott for being here to share his work with us. So let's turn the floor over to Scott and give him a, a big welcome. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, but I'm just gonna, it, it's okay if I do this. this. Yeah. Okay, and so uh, as Anne was noting, I, I just wanna talk a little bit about my new book, um, War and Peace in the Taiwan Strait. Um, okay. Okay, so it, it wasn't too long ago, uh, actually, um, that the relationship across the Taiwan Strait um, looked like it had stabilized uh, quite considerably. Uh, so during the presidency of Ma Ying-jeou, who was Taiwan's president from 2008 to 2016, uh, we actually saw an unprecedented detente uh, in the relationship between Taiwan and mainland China. Uh, for the first time uh, in decades, the two sides were engaged in extensive dialogue with each other. Uh, the, the economic relationship across the Taiwan Strait had largely been normalized. Um, for the first time since the end of the Chinese Civil War in the late 1940s, you had direct travel opened up across the Taiwan Strait. Um, and this, this process of uh, detente kind of culminated 
uh, in this meeting between uh, the leaders from the two sides, Ma and Chinese President Xi Jinping, uh, in Singapore in 2015, um, which again was 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 quite unprecedented and um, was seen as kind of a, a landmark meeting at the time. Um, so this was a time when we really saw kind of the Taiwan issue move to the back burner, right, in places like Washington, where people weren't really talking for a period of time about the risk of military conflict in the Taiwan Strait. Um, people were more focused on things like the North Korean nuclear program, the Iranian nuclear program, and uh, and so forth. Um, okay, but this all changed pretty dramatically um, beginning in 2016 with the election of Tsai Ing-wen as Taiwan's president. Um, Tsai is generally seen uh, in the U.S. Uh, as being quite pragmatic and moderate in her approach to cross-strait relations, and I largely agree uh, with that assessment of her cross-strait policy. Um, but one thing that Tsai has not been willing to do, um, and her party, the Democratic Progressive Party, has not been willing to do, that uh, her predecessor Ma was willing to do, uh, is accept a version of a one-China principle. Okay, this idea that, in principle, we should think of Taiwan as being a part of some greater one China. Okay, and the PRC's position since the 1990s um, has essentially been that if Taiwan's government is not willing to kind of embrace this idea that we're all part of the same one China, then we have nothing to talk about. Okay, and so the PRC has basically made this a, pre a precondition for dialogue with the Taiwan government. Um, and consequently, after Tsai's election, right, all this dialogue that we saw during the Ma administration basically came to a screeching halt. Um, and since 2016, uh, Beijing has kind of steadily ratcheted up coercive pressure against uh, Taiwan and Tsai's government. So it's done things like put diplomatic pressure on Taiwan by picking off some of Taiwan's um, some of the few remaining countries in the world that still recognize the Taiwan government, the Republic of China, as the Chinese government, right? And getting those countries to recognize the People's Republic of China instead. Um, it's uh, uh, it's put economic pressure on Taiwan, and and probably most visibly, it's put increased military pressure on Taiwan, right? And this is uh, manifested in a number of forms over the past few years, including regularly circumnavigating the island of Taiwan with. Uh, with military uh, aircraft, um, uh, sending military aircraft into Taiwan's self-declared air defense identification zone. Um, and, and especially over the last uh, couple of years, especially like kind of post uh, Nancy Pelosi's very highly publicized visit to Taiwan in 2022, um, when the PRC undertook like a large number of military exercises in the Taiwan Strait and the vicinity. Um, it also started crossing the midline of the Taiwan Strait um, on a very regular basis okay, um, with, with military okay, something that he has largely refrained. And so, so clearly, um, I, I, in a Taiwan status as kind of a potential flashpoint for conflict is, is very much uh, kind of self-evident again. Um, and the risk of military conflict in the Taiwan Strait has gotten a lot of attention. And so we see this of course, in the media, and, and you know, uh, especially in the aftermath of the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, right? There's a lot of kind of discussion about how might Taiwan be kind of next. Uh, but even before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, right? You saw kind of a lot of focus on possible Taiwan contingen contingency. So this is a, a cover from the Economist magazine from 2021, um, basically uh, suggesting, right, somewhat hyperbolically, that uh, that Taiwan is the most dangerous place on earth. Um, we've also seen a number of high-ranking uh, military officials uh, in the United States uh, kind of point to the risk of military conflict. So here's a quote from Philip Davidson, um, who at the time was the commander of uh, U.S. Indo-PACOM, uh, in testimony to Congress in 2021, kind of suggesting that uh, a PRC military use of force against Taiwan was something that was likely in the next six years. Um, and other high-ranking U.S. officials have um, made some pronouncements recently. Okay. At the same time, uh, others are uh, somewhat more sanguine about kind of the, the, the risk of conflict. And, and so here I've put up a, uh, an op-ed um, from three very well-known experts on Taiwan, all of whom um, are kind of very uh, kind of well-respected on this issue, basically arguing that, um, that the U.S. is essentially overhyping the risk of a military conflict in the Taiwan Strait. And so um, the, the overarching kind of question that motivated the book project was, 
know, how worried should we be about the possibility of armed conflict in Taiwan Strait? Um, and the goal of the book project was to try to kind of think through if a conflict were to happen, how would it occur? Okay, and, and I kind of begin by emphasizing that um, it's actually really difficult to assess the prospects for conflict in the Taiwan Strait because uh, cross-strait relations are characterized by a, a number of trends that have complex and at times contradictory implications for stability uh, in the Taiwan Strait. Okay, and so just to give a few examples, um, one big obvious trend that we've seen over the past few decades has been a large shift in the military balance of power in the Taiwan Strait in the PRC's favor. Okay, and so here I'm putting up just kind of a crude indicator of the balance, which is just military spending in China and Taiwan. So the, the green and the blue bars are basically two different estimates of military spending in the PRC. Um, and the, 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 the black bars at the bottom are PRC, are, are military spending in Taiwan, right? Um, and clearly what's going to happen, not just over the past uh, decade and a half, like here, but going all the way back into the 1990s, it's military spending in Taiwan has basically been stagnant. Right, even as it's grown uh, exponentially in the PRC. And if you look at kind of other kind of indicators of PRC military capabilities, right, like on a more qualitative level, clearly they've improved dramatically, especially over the last decade. Okay, and so the military balance of power in the Taiwan Strait has clearly shifted over the past couple of decades. Um, and if you're kind of thinking about what this means for stability in the Taiwan Strait in light of the PRC's claim to be the rightful owner of Taiwan, it's troubling. Right? It suggests that um, that a PRC use of force against Taiwan is something that's becoming a more realistic possibility. Okay, also uh, potentially troubling uh, um, when kind of thinking about prospects for stability are social and political trends in Taiwan. Okay, and so in um, so the Democratic Progressive Party, which I noted at the outset, right, is a is a party that has not been willing to kind of accept a one China principle. Right, has won the last two presidential elections in Taiwan. Okay, but more broadly, um, we've kind of seen a shift in kind of how people in Taiwan think about themselves in recent decades. Um, and so here I've put up a chart that just kind of it's a it's a, um, a survey that kind of has been asked has has been fielded kind of on a regular basis going back to the early 1990s, um, and it asks uh, Taiwan individuals whether they think of themselves as Chinese as Taiwanese or as both Chinese and Taiwanese. If you go back to the 90s, right, um, even into the early 2000s, right, the percentage of respondents who said that they were either just Chinese or both Chinese and Taiwanese typically were a majority of respondents, right? And uh, with um, and, and that, that the, the blue bar here is, is Chinese and the pink is, uh, is both Chinese and Taiwanese. Um, but what you see is that kind of over time, the percentage of respondents who uh, say that they're just Taiwanese, the green bar, um, has emerged in recent years as being kind of a clear majority of respondents, right? And so in, in, the, in the past decade and a half, a majority of Taiwan citizens don't even think of themselves as Chinese, right, in, a, in kind of political terms, right? And so if you're looking at this from China's perspective, it's somewhat alarming, right? So it suggests that kind of the longer that this issue stays in play, Right, the more that Taiwan is going to be less Chinese. And so it, it perhaps gives reason to think that the PRC might be uh, impatient. Right? And further kind of reinforcing concerns like this kind of center on leadership issues in China. Right? And so many argue that uh, current Chinese president and general secretary of the Communist Party, Xi Jinping, um, is less patient than his predecessors to make progress on this issue, seeing it as a legacy issue uh, he's indicated on um, multiple occasions, for instance, that this is not an issue that should be passed on to future generations. Um, and some studies have suggested that public opinion in the PRC has be become more hawkish, right? And so here I've put up an article by um, a, a headline for, uh, of an article from um, that was written by Jessica Chen Weiss, a very prominent expert on Chinese politics and foreign policy, um, where she kind of surveys different um, public opinion studies uh, in China and, and find some evidence of uh, general hawkishness um, among the Chinese public that's greater among younger generations, right? Which again, gives reason to be concerned about and risk for conflict. Okay, on the other hand, there are other trends that, um, that broadly speaking, we could think of as being stabilizing. Okay, and so I think most obvious here 
um, has been kind of the enormous amount of economic integration that we see both across the Taiwan Strait and um, in terms of China's integration to global markets more broadly. Right? So in recent decades, the PRC has been by far the largest trading partner of Taiwan. It's by far the primary uh, destination for Taiwan's outbound investment. Right? And the PRC also has become uh, quite integrated into global markets. Right? And if we're kind of thinking about what, this, what does this mean for, for prospects for conflict in the Taiwan Strait, like at a minimum, we might think that this greatly raises the cost of conflict okay, for, for Taiwan, but also for the PRC, right, which gets a lot out of uh, these relationships. Okay, and if we kind of go back to Taiwan public opinion, and I apologize, right, I always tell like my students, right, like when I put up a chart like this, never write a paper where you put a chart like this because it's, 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 it's got too much information, right, uh, and, and it's just confusing, okay, but allow me nevertheless to, to use this chart, right, so this is a chart that um, basically uh, gives, it's, it's the same outfit as kind of the previous um, opinion poll that I put up, uh, asking people, kind of going back to the early 1990s, giving them kind of a range of choices about Taiwan's final status. Right? So asking people, should Taiwan be independence right, declare independence right away? Should it embrace the status quo for now, but move toward independence later? Should it embrace the status quo indefinitely? Should it embrace the status quo and make a decision later? Should it embrace the status quo and move toward unification later? And should it move toward unification right away? Okay, and so the, the reddish bars are kind of, the lines are the ones that are kind of the unification ones. So there's not a lot of support for unification, obviously, right? But the greenish ones are kind of support for independence, right? And what you'll notice is kind of the, the two top lines, right? Consistently over time, right? Representing a majority of respondents are are people who don't give any indication of preference over final status issues, right? So these are people who either support the status quo for now, make a decision later, or support the status quo indefinitely, right? And so this suggests um, a considerable amount of pragmatism, right, among Taiwan's public, right? And other polls kind of suggest that, yes, ideally people would support independence, right? But they don't support independence if it would lead to conflict with China, right? And so they're strategic in their considerations. So, so, so there's pragmatism in Taiwan, and, and that potentially gives rise to conflicts. Okay, so, so again, in, in, in my book, like, and just to kind of note, right, um, so I, I kind of, you know, I, I call it kind of war and peace in the Taiwan Strait, and I talk about, yeah, I want to assess, I want to, you know, the motivating question is to kind of think about, you know, how worried should we be about war in the Taiwan Strait, but I don't take a strong position about wh whether war is likely or not, right, so I don't try to kind of pin a, a, a probability. Right, on this on this outcome. Rather, what I try to do is I try to kind of think through like how could a war occur, right? And like how could we kind of develop frameworks for thinking about how a war would occur that would kind of incorporate some of these different trends that I just described. Okay, and so the approach that I take is um, it's largely a rationalist approach where I try to kind of um, contextualize insights from bargaining literature and international conflict to the Taiwan Strait. Okay, and I and I begin by noting that. Um, both China and Taiwan have a mix of revisionist and status quo preferences regarding Taiwan. Okay, so China um, clearly has this uh, big revisionist preference of wanting unification with Taiwan, right? Um, but at the same time, it has a status quo preference of wanting to stop Taiwan's movement toward independence, right? It doesn't want to see Taiwan kind of drifting away. Okay, and you can make the same argument about Taiwan. On the one hand, it's got a status quo preference of avoiding being coerced into unification. Okay, but it also, at a minimum, wants more international space and recognition, right? And this is there's a broad consensus in Taiwan about that. Um, and many in Taiwan, um, in, in an ideal world, would like to see something resembling formal independence. Okay, and so this in turn means that there's kind of two broad pathways to conflict in the Taiwan Strait, where each side is kind of pursuing its revisionist goals that kind of run up against the status quo preferences of the other side, right? So one pathway to conflict kind of is centered on um, uh, what you might term Taiwan revisionism, uh, where a conflict would be rooted in actual or potential efforts by Taiwan to formalize its independence or effectively preclude unification as a viable future scenario. Uh, and then a second uh, pathway kind of centers on Chinese revisionism. Right, where uh, conflict is rooted in efforts by the PRC to realize its own highly revisionist preference of, of formal. Okay, so 
I just want to kind of walk through and how I think about these different kind of broad pathways. Okay, and, and I'll just kind of note that the, all of the analysis is kind of grounded in a very kind of stylized model of the cross-strait relationship that I develop in the book. Okay, and, and, and so the, in the model, I basically kind of think of China and Taiwan as basically bargaining over Taiwan's sovereign status, okay, which can range on a continuum from unification with the PRC to formal independence, right, on the other end of the continuum, where China's ideal outcome clearly is at the unification end. And I assume for simplicity that Taiwan's ideal outcome is toward the independence end. Um, but of course, this is contested uh, in Taiwan, and I'd be happy to talk to you. Okay, so, so you can think of the status quo as kind of residing somewhere in between these outcomes. Right? So Taiwan currently enjoys de facto independence, right? It has its own government, it has its own military, right? But at the same time, it lacks international legal recognition, right? And it has only like 12 countries still that even have kind of formal diplomatic ties uh, with the Taiwan. Okay, so you can imagine that if the two sides were to fight a war, that this would result in some new outcome, okay, in terms of Taiwan's status. Right. And so you could kind of, and I've just kind of arbitrarily put W to the top of the status quo here, but you know, it doesn't really matter where you put it for the logic of kind of the argument. Okay. So uh, you could kind of think of this in two ways, right? So you could think of this as the two sides kind of fight a war, right? Um, there's some negotiated outcome at the end of the war where, in this case, Taiwan basically agrees to kind of back down and accept some greater level of Chinese sovereignty over Taiwan, right? Maybe perhaps kind of recognizing explicitly a one China principle or whatever, right? Another way of kind of thinking about this outcome is you could think of it as a probabilistic outcome. So the two sides fight a war, there's some probability that China wins and imposes its preferred outcome of unification, right? And the, the higher that probability, the further to the left on this continuum W on the side. War, of course, is costly. Right? And, um, and I don't think I need to say a lot about how horrifically costly an actual shooting war in the Taiwan Strait would likely be. Um, never mind the possibility that could escalate actually to a broader war between the US and China, both see nuclear powers. Right? And so those costs associated with war are going to detract from the utility that each side gets from the war outcome. Right? And so once you kind of think about those war costs factored in, Right? Each side's war utility is not going to reside at W. It's going to, for in Taiwan's case, it's going to kind of reside further away from its ideal outcome of independence, right? At a point that I've kind of labeled here at point T. Right. And, and for China, it's going to reside further away from its ideal point of unification. Right. At a point here I've labeled point R. Right. And so you could kind of the reason I've labeled point R is you could kind of think of this as China's red line or its reversion point, the point at which it's indifferent between accepting some level of status for Taiwan and wanting to initiate military conflict to try to get a better outcome, right? And so in this kind of very stylized model, as long as the status quo resides to the left of point R, the PRC, and I'm assuming that if there's a war, the PRC is gonna be the one that initiates use of force, right? Taiwan's not gonna attack China um, in today's world. Chiang Kai-shek maybe would have uh, thought about it, but. Uh, in today's world, the, the PRC would initiate conflict, right? And so as long as the status quo resides to the left of point R, the PRC prefers to accept that status quo rather than initiate. Uh, okay, so then how do you get to that? Right, so again, I kind of, in the book, I kind of think about kind of two broad scenarios. So one is kind of a, a, a war that's rooted in Taiwan, where to kind of label Taiwan revisionism, your efforts to by Taiwan to kind of reconceptualize the status quo in a way that resides closer to the independence of the continuum, right? And so, so one possibility here is, is pretty straightforward. You have a revisionist Taiwan government, a Taiwan government that's not happy with the current status quo, right? Trying to redefine that status quo in a way that crosses China's red lines, right? In, in the model, thereby triggering a military response. Again, if you go back to the 90s and the 2000s, Right. When, when analysts of the cross-strait relationship thought about how could a conflict occur in the Taiwan Strait, this is the scenario that they typically had in mind. Right? Why did they have this in mind? Because Taiwan was doing stuff that looked like this kind of a scenario. Okay, so for instance, uh, during the Li Donghui administration, 
uh, during the 1990s. Uh, Taiwan's President Li um, made a kind of concerted effort to raise Taiwan's international profile, in a sense to, um, to reverse what had been kind of decades of international setbacks for Taiwan, right? Such as losing its seat in the UN and so forth, right? Losing recognition from the United States uh, and, and on and on, right? And so he did things like travel abroad, um, including uh, in 1995, visiting his alma mater, uh, Cornell University, um, a visit which, uh, and giving a political speech, a, a visit which kind of triggered uh, a, a significant uh, and prolonged military crisis in the Tenement Strait. Okay, you could also kind of look at statements made by past and, and even the, the, the current president of Taiwan. It's kind of uh, falling under this logic of a, of a Taiwan government that's kind of pushing uh, the envelope on status related issues. Right, so Li, um, also Li in his administration, referred to the cross-strait relationship uh, as being a state-to-state -state relationship or at least a special state-to-state -state relationship. Okay, implying that Taiwan should be thought of as a country of equal stature to the PRC. Okay, um, his, pre his successor, uh, Chen Shui-bian of the Democratic Progressive Party um, began to kind of uh, outline a formulation for how to think about the cross-strait relationship as being each side of the Taiwan Strait is a separate country. Okay, again, suggesting that Taiwan is its own independent separate country of equal stature to the PRC. And indeed, from China's perspective, it was even worse than Li's formulation because he didn't qualify it by saying, well, at least a special state-to-state uh, -state relationship. Okay, and even uh, current President Tsai Ing-wen has kind of described Taiwan as being independent, although she's kind of given a hat tip, unlike uh, Chen Shui-bian, to uh, the Republic of China. Again, you could also look at um, kind of efforts to, to shape Taiwan society and thinking about uh, cross-strait uh, issues, right? And so during the Chen Shui-bian administration in particular, uh, the Chen government uh, undertook um, what he referred to as a rectification of names campaign, okay, where he was basically trying to highlight uh, the Taiwanese-ness of things rather than their Chinese-ness, right? And this took a number of forms, right? Actually renaming state entities, right? Like the, the post office had been the China Post, it was renamed the Taiwan Post while he was president. Um, adding Taiwan in English to the cover of the Republic of China passport. Um, and, and efforts to downplay the legacy of Chiang Kai-shek, right? Who, um, whose great goal, of course, was to, to figure out a way to retake uh, mainland China. Right. And so here I've put up a picture of what the Jiang Kai-shek Memorial Hall looked like in the waning days of the Chen presidency. Uh, the honor guard had been removed. You know, uh, Jiang is kind of sitting there Lincoln-like, kind of looking to the west toward China, but the lights have been turned off. Kites have been hung from the ceilings, kind of obscuring his view. And you have these big placards of Taiwan's democracy movement um, kind of in, in, the, in the room, basically kind of giving him the middle finger, right? And, and so... Right, and so, so you have these efforts during Chen to try to kind of highlight Taiwan's otherness uh, from China. Okay, and so, so in this kind of formulation, you can kind of think of war occurring, um, again, as kind of a consequence of a revisionist Taiwan government kind of pushing the status quo uh, across China's red line there by trading the military response. Okay, I argue in the book that this, this kind of a scenario is ultimately rooted in an information problem. Okay, and, and the reason why you might get war in this kind of a scenario, right? And, and again, if you kind of go back to this simple line, right? Like, like a, a Taiwan president wouldn't actually want to trigger a military response, right? Because the war outcome for Taiwan is terrible, right? It would be awful for Taiwan for there to actually be a war, right? The problem is, is it's hard to know exactly where China's red lines reside, right? And so China's done things like signal that, oh, if Taiwan declares independence, Right, that would be cause for war, right? Or if it indefinitely drags its uh, feet on reunification, that might be cause for war. But it hasn't been explicit about kind of specific things like, you know, efforts to uh, highlight a separate Taiwan otherness from China. Like, what what's the line there? Um, it's it's kind of vague, okay. And it's hard for the PRC to kind of communicate this. Okay, but I argue in the book that there are a number of reasons to to believe that. Over time, this type of a scenario, which greatly worried analysts in the 90s and early 2000s, has become less likely. Okay. Um, most importantly, I think, is that 
the costs of conflict, the downside risk of pushing too far and actually crossing Chinese red lines, right, have become enormous, right, as a consequence of the shift in the balance of military power, right, the PRC could very easily impose huge costs on Taiwan, regardless of whether it could actually occupy Taiwan. Um, and the economic costs would also be gigantic. Right, and so this in turn kind of incentivizes some risk aversion uh, among Taiwan's leaders. And I think you see this. This is partly kind of what drives Taiwan's risk aversion. Right, um, the, the the downside risk of kind of pushing too far, uh, too close to China's red lines um, have gotten pretty high. Um, I also think that China has been quite effective at signaling uh, that it is prepared to use military force in this case. Right, and I think that the United States and Taiwan actually believe that the PRC, if Taiwan goes too far, that military, a military response is a real possibility. And this is as a consequence of decades of um, military signaling coming from the PRC, right? Including like that these high profile exercises that you saw after the PRC exits Taiwan. Okay, and, and finally, I think one, one last important point um, that often gets lost is that, again, Taiwan already has de facto independence, right? It all already enjoys effective sovereignty. Right. And what that means is that to the degree that Taiwan makes further gains on this issue, they're mostly symbolic, not totally, but mostly symbolic, right? It's things like changing the name of the country, getting more international recognition, it's status type things, right? And so uh, I think that matters because I think it makes Taiwan more risk averse, right? Because what's happening is that Taiwan in seeking these gains, right, is basically risking very concrete you know, costs uh, in return to these mostly symbolic gains. And again, I think that incentivizes this. Okay. However, I do argue in the book that there's kind of a more insidious version of a Taiwan revisionist kind of scenario, right? And it's, it's one that's kind of rooted not in kind of actual concrete steps that Taiwan might take today to cross PRC red lines, right? But the possibility that a future Taiwan might pursue revisionist policies, right? And this is a, 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 a scenario that's essentially rooted in fears in China that Taiwan might be slipping away for good, okay? And why might China feel this way? Well, there's a couple reasons, okay? Most importantly are some of the, the domestic kind of societal and political trends that I noted at the outset, right? The fact that people don't really think of themselves as Chinese in Taiwan. Right. The fact that the DPP, although it will be interesting to see what happens in, in January's presidential election, right? But the fact that the DPP has done quite well in presidential elections in Taiwan, right? And so there's these kind of political and social trends in Taiwan, right? Have the effect of um, making Beijing kind of worry about Taiwan over time essentially becoming ungovernable, right? Secondly, in recent years, we've seen a, a pretty dramatic increase in U.S. Taiwan security cooperation. Right? And this worries uh, China a lot, right? It makes Beijing worry about, um, about uh, that cooperation getting to a point where Beijing can't really do anything to stop Taiwan's movement. And so I argue in the, in, in the book uh, that this kind of resembles a commitment problem. Um, Taiwan's leaders essentially can't credibly commit uh, not to alter trends in things like Taiwan public opinion. Um, they can't kind of tie the hands of future Taiwan presidents because Taiwan's a democracy, right? And um, and so it could lead to kind of thinking in Beijing that it needs to act sooner rather than later to avoid a situation where Taiwan essentially becomes irretrievably Chinese. Okay. Um, I do think that there's some kind of mitigating factors here. Most importantly, that the, the shift there are, there are a number of, of trends like the shifting balance of military power, which give Beijing reason for optimism. Right, and so trends aren't unambiguously moving against Beijing, right? And, and perhaps more importantly, um, use of military force doesn't actually solve this problem for Beijing unless Beijing is absolutely confident that it can invade and occupy Taiwan, right? Otherwise, use of military force magnifies its problem by probably reinforcing some of these unfavorable trends, right? It's gonna further undermine you know, views toward China in Taiwan it's going to probably strengthen the DPP uh, and it's going to incentivize closer US Taiwan security. Okay, so then the kind of the flip side, right? And um, 
and, and I think this kind of captures where most of the thinking today is when kind of thinking about kind of the risks of conflict in a time of strain is, is kind of a conflict that's rooted in the PRC's own high, highly revisionist goals of kind of seeking unification, right? And, and here, I'll just kind of begin by noting, right, that key trends kind of suggest that Beijing's overall war utility is probably improving, right? Largely as a consequence of kind of the, the shift in the military balance of power, but also because in recent years, levels of cross strait and economic integration even have kind of leveled off. And there's been an effort by Taiwan to try to diversify its foreign economic ties. And so, okay, and so to the degree that that's the case, right, what it implies is that, right, you have a world where China's red line or its, its reversion point is, is actually moving to the left, right, toward the unification end of the continuum, right? And so you can imagine uh, a war scenario occurring not because Taiwan's kind of pushing the status quo across that red line, but a, a war scenario where uh, China becomes incentivized to use military force because we move into a world where the red line, China's reversion point, actually um, uh, moves to the left of the status quo, meaning that China kind of gets a better outcome from fighting the war than it gets from the status quo. Okay, so once R shifts to the left of the status quo, China prefers to fight. Okay, obviously though, Right, Taiwan is a strategic actor, right? And if we ever get to that kind of a world where R has actually shifted to the left of the status quo, you would expect that Taiwan would begin to bargain, right? And so the you know the war outcome is terrible for Taiwan, right? And so you would expect a Taiwan that begins to yield on sovereignty issues by allowing the status quo to drift le left enough to again disincentivize use of force by Beijing. Okay. And in fact, people have argued that this is likely what's going to happen, right? And most prominent here, who's come across here undergrad, the work of John Mearsheim here. He's familiar with John Mearsheim, right? So kind of well-known realist, right? Like about 10 years ago, uh, he went to Taiwan and was invited to, to, to give a lecture. Oh, Did you hear? <laughs> and, uh, and, and he gave this this lecture uh, funded by the Taiwan government um, entitled Say Goodbye to Taiwan, right? Uh, and basically saying that the point of the lecture was you're, you're all doomed, right? Um, and he published this as a national interest article, um, Say Goodbye to Taiwan. And, and this was basically his point. The balance of power is shifting. The U.S. isn't going to be able to protect Taiwan indefinitely. At some point, Taiwan's just going to have to give up the game and negotiate with the PRC. And the sooner it does it, probably the better, because it'll get a better part. I argue in the book that this kind of accommodation is really unlikely. Um, if we ever get into a world where the, the, the red line is kind of shifted to the left of the status quo, it'd be really dangerous. Why do I think this? Um, well, there are a number of reasons, right? So, so most obviously, it'd be hard for the PRC to actually signal credibly that it is prepared to use military force absent Taiwan accommodation. Why? Because it's lived with the status quo for decades now. Right? And so if it's lived with the status quo for decades, why would suddenly it be able to kind of convince Taiwan that it's no longer willing to do so? Okay, and so there's a big information problem here. Okay, there's also political problems, right? This is something that uh, there, there is very little support for accommodation of Beijing and Taiwan, right? So, so China's kind of preferred model for unification is one country, two systems, right? Which has been enforced in, Taiwan, in, in Hong Kong, right? Did not, you know, China's kind of policies in Hong Kong have not gotten good publicity in Taiwan, right? It's a non-starter with the Taiwan public, right? And so there's, it would be very difficult politically for, for Taiwan's leaders to, to, to give the appearance of accommodating China on sovereignty related issues. Okay? Moreover, people tend to be resistant to bargaining away things that they believe that they already have, right? Um, uh, people tend to kind of be willing to accept risks to protect uh, their, you know, what they think they have relative to kind of the risks that they take to try to get something new, okay? And the Taiwan public overwhelmingly kind of views Taiwan now as possessing sovereignty, right? Whether you call it Taiwan or the Republic of China, right, there's a consensus across the political spectrum that Taiwan or the Republic of China is sovereign. Okay. And so it would be difficult, um, like, like people would, would, I think, tend to be resistant to kind of bargaining that. Okay, and finally, there's really big credible commitment problems here, 
Okay, and, and I think kind of the, the, the biggest issue here is that once Taiwan starts bargaining away some of its power or some of its status or sovereignty, right, it, it's going to create a situation that kind of reinforces the PRC's power over Taiwan, right? And it's really hard for the PRC not to use this increased power against Taiwan. What's an example of this? Well, think about what the U.S. would do if it looked like Taiwan was moving closer to China. Right? Would the U.S. still be willing to sell advanced weapons to Taiwan? I think probably not, right? Um, would there still be as much enthusiasm in Washington about supporting Taiwan? I think not, right? And so uh, it, uh, you kind of have a situation where anytime Taiwan starts kind of accommodating too much toward China, it, it risks its relationship with the U.S., which in turn further erodes Taiwan's bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis China and incentivizes China to demand even more. Okay, and so what this all means uh, is that if I think, I think that if we do reach a point where the PRC believes it could achieve unification using military force at acceptable cost, it'll be exceedingly difficult to find a peaceful way out. Okay, and so the key is to not get to that situation in the first place. Okay, and so how do you do that? Um, there's a lot of focus in Washington on deterrence, right? And I think that that's certainly part of the equation, right? Like making sure that the PRC believes that there are really high costs associated with conflict. I mean, a lot of the focus is on military deterrence, right? Increasing the US military presence in the region, encouraging Taiwan to increase its military capabilities and so forth. Okay, but I think that it's also important to kind of consider other elements that disincentivize PRC use of force against Taiwan, okay, including things like uh, thinking about how tolerable the status quo is to China, right? So thinking not just about cost, but also what's China getting out of status quo. Okay, and so here it's really important to reassure China, right, among other things that the United States could live with unification over the long term if Taiwan is amenable to them, right? And that's something that we haven't really heard coming from US officials in, in recent years, okay? even though it's still officially US policy. Okay, and, and more broadly, to the degree that it's possible, I, I think that, and this kind of runs counter to the overwhelming kind of trend in bilateral relations over the past several years, right, where we've seen kind of talk of decoupling and so forth. I think that's potentially dangerous when thinking about a cross-strait scenario, right, because it's effectively decreasing Beijing's stake in stability in its relationship with the United States, right? And so I think there should be rethinking that as well. So I'll stop there and all right, thank you. Let's yeah. give. All right. Well, um, I know I have a lot of questions, but I want to open it up to the floor. Uh, so, who would like to start off? Yes, and if you could just, so that we can get to know one another, if you could just say your name and how you came to the event and your year. Uh, hi, I'm Colin. I came to the event because I'm a mailing list. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm a third year. Uh, I'm curious about where you, because you talk about the military coercion earlier, the way that China is exercising that on Taiwan. I'm curious where you think China's noted uh, recent nuclear bill fits into this and the way that that might affect a the way they see their ability to wage war at low cost with taiwan and then also the way that that might be uh, not necessarily a deterrent effect against the United states per se but also against taiwan trying to shift taiwan's like perception of risk yeah so i mean so i think the nuclear angle right like most effects you know like uh the, the kind of the prospects for U.S. China interactions, right? Like, like so, like China's not going to use nuclear weapons against Taiwan, right? Like, I mean, they they could, right? But like, you know, it's like, yeah, we have to destroy it to save it, kind of logic, right? Like, if like they wouldn't even be able to live there, right? Anyway, so um, okay, so so I don't think that that's uh, I don't think they they meaningfully kind of directly affect the balance of power in terms of straight weapons, but they potentially affect strategic bargaining between the United States and China. Right. And so to the degree right now, there, there are concerns in China about like the robustness of its nuclear deterrent. Right. And so part of the motivation, right, is to kind of get closer to parity with the United States. Right. And then um, the idea would be that there's a stronger deterrent. Is that, you know, it, it's 
there have been periodic kind of hints, um, not recently that I'm aware of, but in the past, like hints of willingness to potentially use nuclear weapons, right, in a Taiwan contingency, right, where um, like a general at one point, like this was like in 2000, kind of, you know, is the U.S. prepared to trade Los Angeles for Taiwan, right, like the statement to that effect, right, but, um, I, you know, in general, like I, I don't think that they're super relevant, right, other than, right, it's kind of looming over, Right, like if, if there's a U.S.-China war over Taiwan, right, that's kind of loom and nu two nuclear powers have never fought a war against each other, right, and so it's it's kind of scary, right, and and so I think it probably induces a little bit more caution in Washington, but I think that that caution is already there because you know frankly, like U.S. can't really realistically launch a first strike, and and I don't think ever would launch a, a you know a, a first strike against china's nuclear program right as a way to kind of neutralize it um, so i'll just kind of say i don't think it has a huge implication for stability in the taiwan strait but at the margins it probably makes the u.s more risk of thank you thank you uh let's see in the back and again, it's people to introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Julia. I'm a third year undergraduate. How do you anticipate the upcoming January election in influencing your findings? Yeah, um, well, so it's going to depend on what happens. Um, and I'm not going <laughs> to, I wouldn't put money on it right now because uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, right? And so you know about the, so there's this agreement between um, the, the two kind of anti DPP candidates to, to court. Um, if the if the blue ticket, sorry, so the the KMT or if Kuenja is at the top, right? so if that ticket wins, I I, I think you're clearly going to see some easing of tension. No doubt about it. Um, both of them want to improve relations with China. I, I think that Beijing will probably accommodate to some degree. Because if, if, if they can't open the door to dialogue again with China, then this is going to be a completely losing political issue in Taiwan. And the so, so I do think that if the blue camp wins, there will be some stabilization. The question is, is kind of, I don't think that um, that the Pam Blue camp, and by Pam Blue, if you're not familiar, this is kind of the nationalist camp in Taiwan. Um, so the camp that's out of power, but that was in power when Ma Ying-jeou was president when you had to taunt, right? And, and so they're still advocating for detente, China. Um, even when Ma Ying-jeou was president, I, you know, and you had this kind of unprecedented dialogue across the Taiwan Strait, Ma would not talk politics, right? Like he, he was not willing to kind of open the door to, to dialogue over Taiwan's status, right? Which is what the PRC really wants. Right. And there were reports at the time that, that that Xi Jinping was getting a little bit impatient about this and wanted to see some more concrete progress on political issues. Um, so the question is, is if the if the nationalists or like an ally party come to power, like, and they don't, and, and I, I think that they would continue to drag their feet on political issues, like how patient would China be? And, and would it kind of further erode and you know, uh, narrative that peaceful unification is possible. If there's foot dragging, even when the the, the like, coalition's in power. If uh, um, if Lai Qingda, uh, the Democratic Progressive Party candidate wins, I think you'll just see the status quo um, might get a little bit worse, right? Because I think that the PRC kind of views him as being worse than Tsai given his past record. But they, they don't have a very high opinion of Tsai either, right? And so, uh, I think that tensions will continue, and and by status quo, I, I mean kind of continue ratcheting up of tension against. Them. In an ironic way, you see like the blue party winning as actually posing more risk. It potentially throws a wild card in there, right? Like it, it it could it could pose more risk, like in a in a couple of years from now, if there's frustration in Beijing about foot dragging. Lin Shapa from the politics department. So I was trying to think what kind of uh, red lines China might try to draw if it was trying to pull um, in that direction. And it seems like the one thing, one uh, line it could draw is that 
So now we let you buy pretty much what you want from the U.S. in terms of military equipment. But now we're going to start specifying that there are certain things that uh, if you buy these things from the U.S. government, you'll be crossing our line. So it's not too different from what Putin is doing to Ukraine and, and saying if the U.S. supplies fighter jets, you know, that's somehow going to cross the line. Um, so we have that very immediate parallel. So it's got to be on the Chinese uh, strategy list. And it does do what you described of, of eventually weakening Taiwan mm -hmm. and making them resistant to doing this up. But on, on the other hand, it's not a total erosion of their sovereignty. It's not saying you can't buy any of them, but asking them in their treaty with the U.S. Um, so I can, it's, it's just such a gentle step that that's what the Chinese have been doing, right? These kinds of gray zone things. Um, and this would be kind of a political gray zone tactic. So how, how, why shouldn't we expect something like that to gradually erode? Yeah, so they, I mean, they could do something like that. But he, so a couple of thoughts on this. Like, first of all, um, so the U.S. actually does kind of accommodate, like, so like, so by law, the U.S. isn't supposed to consider this, right? The Taiwan Relations Act is very explicit, right? And and uh, that that the U.S. is supposed to make sales to Taiwan based solely on Taiwan's decisions, right? And, uh, and the, you know, the U.S., like, in its assurances that Taiwan is also kind of that's not going to consult about about arms. So, um, so we set aside that. Right? There are there are a couple of things that I think um, are worth kind of highlighting. One is that right, despite kind of what U.S. law is right, like the U.S. does like, is kind of does tread cautiously these issues. Right, and so the so Taiwan doesn't get to buy the F thirty five. Right, it gets. It's still getting F 16s right now. They're fancy F 16s, but they're F 16. Like, yeah, back in the 80s, that was a thing to get F 16, right? But I mean, they're, they're 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 souped up or whatever, right? Like they've got fancy radar, but but still not the most advanced platforms. Um, so there is some accommodation, like furthermore, like the U.S. view, I think the consensus view in Washington is it's, it's stupid to be selling these things to Taiwan anyway. Because they're counterproductive, right? Why are they counterproductive? They're expensive, and they're going to be useless very quickly in a cross-strait conflict because China has over is easily going to achieve air superiority, right? And so Taiwan shouldn't be wasting its precious few dollars of defense budget on big, expensive fighter jets. It should be buying mundane things that make it difficult to, to, to land on and occupy Taiwan. And so, and these aren't the, the fancy things that, you know, people draw red lines over. Right? So those are just a couple of thoughts. <laughs> that also makes it less likely that the U.S. would resist getting in on this. You, you, you said that one of the reasons Taiwan wouldn't give in is because the U.S. would object. But this might be one that they would, that the U.S. would go along with. So it makes it even safer for, for China to do it. If it's initially fairly symbolic, it sets the stage for asking for the next weapon system, the next weapon system. It's possible. Like, but again, I think that like I think that it would be incentivizing the US then to do it. Like I think the opposite would happen. Right? Like, it, like you would you would have like action in Congress, like how dare China tell us what to do? And there would be a like a resolution immediately passed, let's sell Taiwan X of whatever China said we shouldn't tell it, sell them. Right. Just to stick it in Beijing's face and, and and then what does China then China backs itself into a court? And what does it do if the US sells it anyway? Right. So you could tell that, that you could flip it around, right, and say that is China getting a lot out of this by drawing this kind of a red line? And where are the downside risks if the U.S. just kind of ignores it? Then China's credibility, is, and then it has to do something. Right. And so I think it's it, it could happen. I don't think it's super likely, and and I think this is part of why China has been reluctant to draw these kind of sort of explicit red lines. Right. Like so, they've got big, you know, you know things that. Like our you know, clearly stated Taiwan Declaration of Independence, reestablishment of a military alliance with the foreign occupation of Taiwan, indefinite foot dragging on unification, right? These are the big red lines that China draws, but they're like, you know, like kind of beyond the pale things, right? Or indefinite foot dragging, it's it's, it's vague and, you know, and refers to like some somewhere down. Let's see, we have some questions in the back. This gentleman here. Well, 
Uh, I'm Audrey, as graduate student at the history department. So I have a question about two things that you mentioned in your uh, presentation. Um, number one, um, you showed that interesting graph about the changing balance of power in the Taiwan Straits, how Chinese defense spending grew and Taiwanese kind of stagnated. Number two, you mentioned that, uh, well, not in the same wars, but if we were here 10 years ago, we would probably talk about tensions in the South China Sea or, or Chinese penetration of the, of the global South, things like that, but not Taiwan. So I guess I'm curious in this context, how central in your opinion the Taiwan question actually is to Beijing? Um, having in mind that, and I guess what I'm trying to understand is how much that increase actually has to do with growth of Chinese global power and global reach and how much actually it has to do with Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. And I don't have like a nice answer to it other than to say, like, I think it's very important in Beijing for a variety of reasons um, that have to do both with kind of just, you know, it, like I, I think that leaders kind of feel like the issue has to be important just because of the nature of how the Chinese Communist Party has legitimized itself over the past several decades, right? Um, Taiwan is kind of framed as this kind of travesty of justice, right? Like. Uh, and you can kind of go on and on, right? And so it's it's seen as something that's rightfully Chinese, right? And, and I kind of buy into this argument that no leader in China would want to see, you know, would want to preside over kind of like an obvious like loss of face over this, this kind of issue. Okay. Whether that incentivizes actual taking Taiwan, right? I think that that's a clear cut. Right? And I think that this is something like Xi Jinping, I think would think that it would be nice have Taiwan. Right? This would be a nice feather in his cap, the one that unifies Taiwan. Would he risk um, everything over this? I don't think so. And so I think it's important. I think it's more important not to have like a major loss with regard to Taiwan than to make gains with regard to Taiwan. As long as you can kind of make a case that things are moving, broadly speaking, in the right direction. So that's, I guess that's what I would say. But I do think that there is kind of a view that over the long term, like China's strategic goals in the region necessitate China's. See, um, a question here, and then, oh, actually, I think you had a question first. So, oh, and then, yeah. Sorry, Matt's actually visiting for the Oh, which Randolph College. Oh, great. Okay. okay. Um, my question is how, so, with regards to the to the um, PRC's red, red line, how how well do we understand the decision making in the, in the, in the Chinese government? I'm I'm thinking also of uh, in my mind, and this is probably not the right thing to do, but comparing this to Russia and Ukraine, the decision, no, I, the decision making process yeah. that happened there, where it it seemed like it was you know up to one person at the top is, is this like yeah no i think i think like if there were going to be if, if china were going to make the decision to go to war over taiwan it would be xi jinping's final decision so so how how that gets presented to him I, i'm not sure right like how that would get framed who would have the ability to kind of frame it in a particular way to him right but certainly he given the way that he centralized power in china he would make the final decision so that, like, like, there would not be much dissent. I don't know. There might be dissent, um, but it's hard to see. like. It's not. It's not going to be visible. Um, I don't know. But I, I should like turn to Brantley here. And, like <laughs> his thing, but I'm, I'm kind of. I don't think no. No one would. No one would step up and dissent. Right. Like that would be fatal. Um, whether behind the scenes, right? There's discussion of like there's debate about whether there's. Even now, whether there's some pushback against Xi, I kind of doubt that there's a lot. Um, but right, like it would it would be hard for an external observer to see. Let's see, we have a question. Yeah, the, the very recently, uh, yesterday or well, two days ago, Xi Jinping and uh, Biden met. Right? Uh, did they reach any uh, agreement on Taiwan issue? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They, looked at, they didn't talk about it? I'm sure they talked about it. I don't know. I didn't look at a uh, detailed readout. Um, I'm sure that they kind of exchanged kind of general talking points about it. 
Okay. Um, so my name is Ika. I'm currently a third year undergrad, and uh, I can make a supplement to that. So earlier this week, between uh, uh, Xi Jinping and Biden, there's a meeting, and uh, I believe like she actually expressed that China currently have no plans to have a military action to Taiwan between 20, 2027 to 2035. So uh, although we know that uh, it doesn't mean that she uh, don't want to yeah. uh, attack Taiwan. But I mean, how, I wonder how would you interpret that, uh, uh, how the Sino US kind of currently want to avoid this conflict, but while the conflict is still explicit? Yeah, no, I think that, like, so this is referring to the fact that there's just been this like, overwhelming, right? So, like, she, like there are intelligence reports that she wants the keep it going by 2027 uh, to be able to take that, right? which is very different from it, having a plan or intent. Right? Um, but that's how it, it's been framed right, in the United States. It's almost become conventional wisdom. And again, I put up this quote by you know, the, the former uh, head of indo paycom who basically make, asserting this, right, that this is going to happen by 2020. And so I think that she was just was kind of pushing back against this conventional wisdom in the United States, right? Which, like, at least like publicly, there's no, I, I have not seen any evidence that has a specific timeline. I think that he was kind of trying to push back against it. That, that's how I would interpret it. And, and I think that that's probably true. It could change, obviously, if facts something wrong. I was just wondering, you said that you have a question. At least his name, but he says this has a generational issue. How much longer do you see it? That's a good question. Uh, it could be indefinitely. Right? <laughs> um, I, I don't know how long he's going to try to stay in power. Um, Clearly, he's run right through the norm, the not not super long lived norms, but norms that had established in terms is almost every year. So uh, he he could be he's only seventy. Like we were talking about this before, right? Like I, I like like my undergrads are like I, I was talking about like what could it, you know lead to conflict in the Taiwan Strait, and someone said, oh well, Xi Jinping's getting old, like he could die at any moment. I'm like, he's only seventy. Well, of course, it's like the 50 year old saying this, right? <laughs> 70 is like the new 40 or something. <laughs> right? so, um, so I, I think he could be in power for a while. Um, I don't know, like, I think 10 years is a real this, but who knows, right? But he also, right, like, I don't know that his health is super robust, right? And so there's always that wild card. But but again, you know, he's the leader of a, of a country, right? Like, he probably gets good medical care. And so, <laughs> um, so I think he'll be around for a while. Would be my guess. Ready? I will mark uh, 40 something. <laughs> Center and East Asia Center. And I have a, I'd like to read the question about our, our, our concept of war here, because I think as Americans, we, we think well, most recently of Putin invasion of Ukraine, that's war, or Afghanistan, or Iraq. You know, these are wars. You go in, you change the government you're against, and you occupy until you've established a solid democratic government that you can leave in place, like Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what's China's idea of a war? What wars has China experienced? You have the Vietnam War, about a month, only involving border provinces in Vietnam and a retreat starting as soon as the last provincial capital was taken. And you have the India border order before that. So what about, but don't forget Korea. Uh, oh it's, it's a little more complicated. <laughs> but, um, but those two that were really China's wars uh are are more limited. And I wonder if if when we think about military coercion rather than shows of force in the Taiwan Straits, if we shouldn't think about options other than 
T-Day, mm -hmm. other than complete occupation, et cetera. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I, I don't, I don't like, and this kind of comes back to the point, right? I don't think that Xi Jinping wants no, right. like, to start World War III over this issue, right? Um, the, the costs are will be catastrophic for China and potentially for his hold on power, right? right? And so, um, so I agree, with, like, and so, I mean, you know, again, I don't like try to assess the likelihood of war. And, um, I do think that that kind of a war is possible. Right, like if, if there's going to be a war between the U.S. and China, it's going to be over this issue most likely. That that's my guess. Maybe maybe yeah, South China. True. But one of Xi Jinping's purposes might be to separate the Taiwan issue from the question of war between U.S. and China. Yeah, no, and and the limited strike uh, might be more effective in that. Yeah, absolutely. Like the the, the goal, like the the the, pri the the absolute goal is peaceful reunification, which means. Like don't invade, like not invasion and occupation, right? It doesn't mean no coercion, right? Right, and um, and thinking of how to use military coercion effectively is absolutely part of it. Yeah, and 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 the U.S. and Taiwan should be very worried. About that. I don't think about that in my book, but <laughs> but, but next book, yes, yeah, maybe. <laughs> right, maybe out of the security business. <laughs> um, yes. My name is Alexander. I graduated in May, but I saw the email until I came. Um, in terms of deterring the PLA, how important it would an intervention in favor of Taiwan by Japan or Australia or other partners in the region in their capitals? Yeah. I, so I think it. I think it's some, So clearly, this is something the U.S. has sought right? is greater multilateral kind of coordination over regional contingencies and most obviously Taiwan. Um, Japan, like, so, like, yeah, uh, like Australia, yes, it, it certainly adds to concerns that the PRC would have. Like, so the more, the more U.S., like, incredibly signaled that it's got, like, a broad alliance of, like, what, UK, right, Australia, um, possibly Japan, right, like, intervening, right? It affects, kind of, perceptions in the PRC about, kind of, like, how a war is going to play out. Japan is a wild card. Right, for a number of reasons, right? like it's it's hard to kind of predict what Japan would actually do in, in this kind of a conflict, right? Given right, constraints on our projection and so forth, right? But or or actually kind of intervene intervening. Um, but even kind of beyond all that, uh, it's 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 not clear, right? Especially if we're talking about kind of a, a limited conflict scenario. Bramley was just kind of describing it's something short of a major war. Um, it's unclear like whether Japan's entry or involvement is something that enhances deterrence or makes the situation much more likely to escalate, right? Because of the inflammatory nature of Japanese involvement from China's perspective. Right? And so I think that the more Japan is involved, the harder it's to control escalation. Because like part of the narrative here is that this is a place that was stolen by Japan right? and, and colonized by Japan for 50 years. And so it, it very much, and, and kind of the overall kind of uh, antagonistic relationship that centers on kind of historical issues in China and Japan, I think complicates what it would mean if Japan here. And so it has the potential to make escalation more likely in a limited conflict scenario but right in a in a major conflict right like I, I think that expectations of japanese involvement on, on balance give china more reason for it. we have time i think for one final question um, but i do want to give anyone else who has a question the chance to raise your hand and maybe scott can do a, a lightning round for the last five minutes to to synthesize the, the different questions so i think i saw one here and then one uh one over here and so if you could actually ask your question and introduce yourself um, hi everyone i'm sammy and i'm actually taiwanese so it's interesting sitting here and listening to like so but i'm really curious because like i was like a born and raised in taiwan so all those things are really you know, like I grew up from those backgrounds. So I can tell like um 
when the templates come out, then people are like making it like a really, you say it like a, we will think it's like a slide but we don't really like know it will be the real thing happen like the word. Like my friends in Germany say, oh, are you okay? Like um, they're saying that China is fighting you or something. I said, oh, I didn't receive anything from our news in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, like uh, from your perspective, like um, what's the U.S., what is the, you say it, like uh, this U.S. see Taiwan as a business partner or as a line? Oh, it's a, where like a, also democracy. Okay. The business partner or ally? Yeah. Ah, okay. All right. Okay. And then uh, Professor Shaw. So, I mean, it's probably too big a question for you to tackle, but your framework implies that countries are making these decisions very rationally. And I can sort of see, especially when Taiwan and China are interacting, that they could be fairly rational. But the U.S. government <laughs> uh, getting involved... <laughs> And somehow I find it hard to imagine that we can count on that. Um, so that if some accident happens and it seems to, uh, that American honor is uh, at stake, it won't take much for blustering to begin in the competition between parties in the US to make sure one is clearly more hawkish than the other. So how do you, how do you bring that kind of a accidental a domestic political escalation kind of a dynamic into a model that had those nice lines, clear points. Yeah, I like footnote that this is not my concern. <laughs> no, it's it's true, right? Like it, 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 um, there, are, there, are, there are a number of kind of scenarios I don't really kind of get at in, right, that are, that get a lot of attention. One is kind of like accidental um, flight right? that, that begins, and you can imagine a Taiwan contingency. South China Sea maybe being more likely. Than this, right? But there was just this incident like recently where um, there was a near collision in Taiwan Strait. And there have been a number of these in the South China Sea. And, and you kind of wonder like the EP3 incident from 2001 when it, you know, I, I, no one remembers this right in the South China Sea. Like, but, you know, I, like uh, you had a, a US reconnaissance plane flying over the South China Sea. About 70 miles off of Hainan Island, collides with a Chinese fighter jet that was harassing it, right? Because of you know, China being upset about kind of US surveillance activities. Um, and Chinese pilot dies, the US plane lands in China, you have this modern day standoff with a 24 member crew, right? And it was bad, right? But that was 2001 when things were not nearly as tense as they are now in US China relations, and China was not nearly as powerful as it is. Right? And so you can only imagine how this kind of a scenario, which could absolutely happen again, right? because these sorts of interactions are going on all the time, right? Uh, how it would play out. And I think you're right that uh, I don't think it would escalate, to, right? But it would be ugly and it would lead to a prolonged standoff. And just think of the spy balloon incident, right? And how ugly that was. And imagine when, if like people are dying because of a collision. So, so yes, uh, uh, I think that that's absolutely the case. Um, that you could imagine uh, a scenario of escalation. I don't think it would lead to war, right? Um, but it would be bad. Um, there's other things too that I didn't really talk a lot about. I did talk like there's another big kind of argument about diversionary conflict. Um, I, I didn't really kind of get to that one. Um, about about Taiwan. Um, yeah. So I, I often like so my you know I, I think you're right that. Like it's way more hyped here than it is in Taiwan, right? The the risk of conflict. And I was kind of noting, right, like when that Economist magazine headline came out, right? There are always memes in Taiwan that kind of made fun of it, right? Like scene from the cat cafe or whatever. <laughs> Scenes from the most dangerous place in the world, right? <laughs> like I think things like this, right? Uh that just kind of ridiculed it, right? Fully, because it was a stupid headline, right? Um, you know, there's there were actual wars going on places at the time, right? And <laughs> people dying and, you know, to call Taiwan the most dangerous place was kind of silly. But, um, uh, but that said, like, U.S. interest in Taiwan, I think, is multifaceted. And it, and it really depends on who you ask. And like, and so if you look at, like, the U.S. Congress, right, like, there's, there's a lot of support for Taiwan. But the reason why people care about Taiwan differs depending on who you're talking to. 
I mean, so for some people, I don't think commerce is the main thing, but it it is certainly for some, especially Taiwan's importance in microchips, right, and 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 so forth. Um, uh, Taiwan's democracy is really important and is a, is a major reason why it enjoys a lot of support in the U.S. Um, but I think like also really important is um, uh, the fact that you have a lot of kind of anti-China sentiment. Right? And there's kind of a sense, I, I think a lot of people are pro-Taiwan because they're anti-China, right? And, um, and so it, it's a mix. I'll just, I'll just kind of leave it. Yeah. <laughs>